Okay, this is a deep dive overview of Motion IQ. I'm on my home screen, you can see the Motion IQ icon on the lower uh, right hand side of the screen. Tap on this. Uh, we're going to select a bike model right here. We're going to pick a Ripmo. The first thing I'm going to do, I've got my bike next to me, I'm going to shake my bike real quick to wake up the sensors. Hold the phone next to the front sensor. You'll see that it's uh, just scanned it and connected. Go ahead and do the same for the back. Shake the bike, hold the phone next to the sensor. And it connected. And then do a quick calibrate. What the calibration does is sets the zero position on the front fork and the rear shock. And then if we want to test this out, I'm just going to click into live mode here and see the yellow line on top is the vibration as I'm shaking the bike up and down. When I push the front fork, you'll see the blue line move up and down. That's the front fork. And if I push down on the back of the bike, there's the back. So that is how you connect to the bike. Once your sensors are already installed, it's uh, very easy to do that. So let's go and do a deep dive on the app itself. Okay, now I've walked away from my bike, you'll see, you'll see that the, uh, the app is searching for the sensors. Uh, we don't really care about that right now because what we're going to do is look at a recording. So in my recordings, these are all the files that I've saved over the last, I don't know, a couple years. Let's just pick one here that might be interesting to look at. Um, so on the summary so on the summary page here, you have a, the first thing you're going to see is the speed and elevation. So the brown is basically what you dropped, and then the white line is the speed in meters per second. Uh, as you come down here, you'll see that there's a waveform, there's a GPS, there's a file um, export um, symbol, there's a note section, there's trash, and then a filter. So what, uh, what you can do here is if you want to actually go in and see the uh, the waveforms. Uh, what we show here is position for the fork and the shock. The g-force is the yellow. You can pinch and zoom so you can basically scroll out. If you want to get rid of the g-force you can turn that off. The blue line is the fork and the yellow line is the shock. This is showing this is showing the uh, position, how deep it goes in the travel as well as the time at the bottom and that's that's pretty much it. If I just wanted to look at speed I can do that here and it remembers where you were on the last page so you can go you can zoom back and forth between uh, the position graph the speed graph if you want to just look at the fork it remembers where everything was at the where you were just where you left off so that's pretty interesting. The next thing here if you want to see where you rode uh, this is this will give you a standard map if you want to look at the satellite view it'll show you the satellite view or a hybrid map it'll actually stick in some um, street names and that kind of thing here if you want to export your file you can export this to Strava uh, Google Earth or GPX which is just basically somebody else that has a GPS device you want to send them your tracks really easy to do just click a button and send it out the cool thing about Strava is that when we when you send your tracks up to Strava, we basically pull down all of the Strava segments for your ride. As long as you've given access to Strava uh, to be to import files from our app, um, that's really easy. So you don't have to record with Strava and Motion IQ. You can just record with Motion IQ and then send your tracks to Strava after the fact. And then you'll get all the segments. And the cool thing about segments is that you can look at any, you can isolate your suspension data down to any Strava segment and we'll look at that in a second but next thing let's go back um, if I want to export the file I can do that through airdrop I can text the file I can email it to somebody I can also save it to um, a cloud drive let's say I've got Google Drive I can come in here and save my file to whatever drive I want I can come through here and you know tap in and, and look at things and find a file that I want to send it to and super easy so as long as you've got the Google uh, Drive app on your phone that is supported if you use box.net you can use that or you can use Dropbox or whatever you want to use the next thing is there's a bunch of data here around um, 
you know how long how long you rode the bike when you start when you stop your GPS moving time versus your lapse time how many Strava segments we downloaded how many pins you dropped so there's a handlebar button that you can drop pins while you ride uh, with those pins you can filter data between those pins to see how your bike was handling on a particular section so that's easy to do uh, we do have an accelerometer in the front fork so you'll see here there's a bunch of measurements here so on vibration measurements this basically shows you out of all the vibration data that we collected what percentage of that vibration was attributed to uh, a compression stroke or a rebound stroke or other other is just basically things that we don't you know we don't um, categorize as a compression or a rebound so if your suspension doesn't move more than 10 millimeters you're gonna get a lot of vibration just riding your bike around so all those samples out of all the samples you know on this day 68 percent were uh, not categorized and they're in the other bucket this fork movement to vibration ratio so this is a think of this as a magic carpet um, metric so it's it's a fraction and the numerator of the fraction is basically the total distance that the fork moved up and down the denominator is the total accumulated samples um, of g-force and we basically just say hey total millimeters of fork travel divided by total g-force samples what is this number and so this number should go up into the right as your bike gets dialed in um, take this number with a grain of salt don't set your bike based on this because as you go faster you're you know you're just naturally going to get more vibration and probably more fork movement so even though you have the same number you know as you get faster it you know it may the number may not not change a lot but once you start getting you know really um, you know really optimized settings you'll see that these numbers do go up to up into the right and then lastly the vibration averages here um, that's the third uh, set of data here this is basically looking at all the accumulated uh, G4 samples and divide by the number of samples for uh, we know when the fork was in compression or when it was in rebound so we can just basically tell you what your average G force was you know overall and in, in between these two things and at the bottom we have a table that just shows how much G force was in compression rebound and overall for each section of the uh, fork so the first third think of that as like almost fully open to 33 percent uh, closed and then the second half would be the second third is going to be the middle part of the fork and then the third third is basically this is deep in the travel so if you're getting uh, into this section you're, you're you're close to I mean you're you're deep in the travel so that's why you see barely any um, percent of the, the data that's that's stuck there okay so let's look at what we collect for the uh, front and rear um, the first thing you're going to see is this axle position so think of this as your o-ring on your fork or shock uh, you're going to sh we're going to show you the minimum position the maximum position average and then total movement so total movement is how how much um, the fork moved up and down during that during that ride okay uh, on compression strokes we're going to look at how many compression strokes what was the maximum speed of the fastest compression stroke the average speed and then the 95th percentile um, this was a pretty aggressive ride on a pretty steep downhill not too many compressions but you'll see that you know he got f over four meters per second on his max compression and that's that's pretty fast uh, rebound strokes you know 425 strokes max speed 27 you know anything over 2500 that's pretty fast I mean I would say that that's kind of enduro world series kind of fast speeds um, typically most folks rebounds are going to be around 1800 on the on the fast you know fast side but as you start to get really really fast you know you're putting your you're pushing your suspension deep in the travel and depending on how fast you want your rebound you know it could rebound pretty quick depending on how far you push that thing in so um, yeah that's that's that so the axle position histogram so what is happening here is on the bottom you'll see some numbers and this rep represents the percent of travel so what we do is we take a in this case I've got a hundred and seventy millimeter fork and we divide this into 20 buckets so every time we get a sample now we're, we're collecting data at 200 samples per second 
So every, what we're going to do is we're going to add, every time we get a sample, we're going to toss it into one of these buckets. Pretty simple idea. But what, what emerges is a, a shape of a histogram that will tell you a lot about your travel. So the shape of this histogram, if you added tokens, the ramp, that ramp, that, you know, this thing looks like a big slide, you can, you can change that ramp of that slide um, by adding in tokens. Likewise, you can, you know, broaden it out by taking out tokens. If you wanted to shift this whole graph to the right, you could take some air pressure out of the fork. If you want to push this whole thing to the left, you could, uh, you know, put some air pressure in the fork. If it's a spring, same thing. You just basically put on more preload to move that data to the left. If you want to move it to the right, take, take some out. And what you'll see here is that, you know, he gets to about 140 millimeters of travel, but he doesn't really know, it's hard to know exactly where, you know, how deep he got. This next one here, this deep axle position histogram is basically the top 20% that is tough to look at up, up above. So if you wanted to see how many strokes he had at 140, just put your finger on the graph and you'll get a little pop up here and you'll see that he had one compression stroke at 140.25 millimeters. He had one at 131.75. So really I would say this is a pretty well set up bike because he's got a lot of margin left here. You know from like 140.25 all the way to you know 170 he's not really using that travel. So if he, if he really does get into trouble he's got some good headroom here. Uh, the compression length histogram. So the same same idea. We um, we basically take every compression stroke. We calculate the the length of that stroke, and we toss that into a histogram. So we just every time we see uh, see a, see a stroke, we just toss it into one of these twenty buckets, and then you're left with a with this shape here. So you'll see that there's not a lot. You know, he had one. You know, way at the deep end here. So you know, basically. 127 millimeter stroke and that's you know he probably had one event that did that the rest of them are pretty much down here at the left which is kind of re represents a lot you know a bunch of smaller strokes compression speed histogram so this will show you what was the speed of every histogram on the bottom we've got millimeters per second on the y-axis we just have a percentage and the percentage just means out of all of this compression strokes what percentage we're at this speed. So when I hold my finger on this and I, I zoom over one of these buckets, I can see that, you know, 941 millimeters per second, he had 6% of those were the, in that bucket range. 732, 9%. So there's, um, you can see the range just by moving left and right. You can see this bucket starts at like 451, ends at about 615. So like I said, there's, um, the, you know the the mean or the average of this is 522 so 26% so you know quite a bit of the strokes are mostly slow but some of them are pretty fast when you when you take that big jump or you hit that rock at speed you know that fork's going to move pretty fast the same thing with the rebound length and the rebound speed kind of similar with what i just said but it's this is on the rebound side so um, you can change the shape of these by um, preload and by changing the damping settings right so that your high and low speed clickers you can change all that um, change the shape of these by changing uh, changing those clicker values uh, the rear has basically the same thing what's different here is that we are looking at the rear axle so if you're confused by you know if your shock has a stroke length of you know 55 millimeters and you come to this axle position here and say Whoa, how do, how do I get to 127.2? Well, it's because we're looking at the rear axle up and down motion instead of the shock. Now, if you want to look at the shock, you're really concerned about just what the shaft speeds are, are on the shock, set your bike up as a generic soft tail, and then um, you can just say, look, here's my travel length, it's 55 millimeters, and the ratio to the rear axle is one. So what that means is um, it's just going to treat. It's just going to look at the shock at that point. Um, so keep that in the, with a grain of salt. Like if you look at the balance data, none of it's going to make sense. So, but if you're just looking at 
if you want to look at shaft speed for the shock, generic soft tail, set your ratio to one and just ignore the balance data because it will not make sense because you know the balance data is all about the front and rear axle motion. Okay, so here we are. So we're at now at looking at the bike uh, balance. And what you'll see here is a this is basically a scatter plot. So what, what this is showing is every compression uh, event for a sh for a fork and the shock. So all the orange dots are uh, rear end, rear axle. All the blue dots are front axle. And so you can see on strokes I've got it set to compression. Tracer is set to both. Front speed is set to vertical. This is very important because you know we want to compare apples to apples. So the, you're measuring the uh, shaft speed of a fork but when you look at your bike um, leverage ratio it's basically showing you for a given shock position what is the vertical axle position so if we want to look at uh, front and rear axles ie how the bike is interacting with the earth we just want to look at vertical motion vertical speeds front and rear and that, that, that's so this basically takes all the guesswork out so you're not having to like do some trigonometry in your head saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm looking at fork shaft speed of, you know, X meters per second. What is that really in the Y, you know, up and down? So that's, people will typically say, hey, yeah, uh, take 11% off the top. And that'll kind of roughly show you what, you know, if you want to balance your front and rear, that's kind of, what, but really if, it, if it's just basic trigonometry, you take the sine of the head tube angle, multiply it by the hypotenuse, which is the, um, you know, that's the, um, the fork um, shaft speed and you can convert it to um, you can convert that to vertical motion um, on the X so there's basically three ways to look at um, data here on the x-axis axis we're looking at travel there's speed and zenith now there's a big difference between these in 99% of the use cases you just go on, you're going to want to look at just travel and what this is looking at is it's not looking at the max position of the stroke, it's only looking at how far the stroke was. So all the dots are gonna to shift to the left because everything starts out at zero. Um, if you look at the zenith, you'll see very few at zero. Everything starts basically at 10, okay? Um, and then, so what happens is we plot every compression uh, stroke and on the bottom we're looking at um, those numbers basically represent the stroke as a percentage of the total travel. So we're also normalizing in the X direction. So even though your bike may have a 170 you know, mil fork and a 140 mil rear end, we don't really care. We're, we're, we're normalizing everything to a percentage. If you want to look at this in raw millimeters, you can change this, but the, you know, you're not really looking, you're not really looking at apples to apples at that point. So. The default is percentage for a reason, and that's why that's why we do that. Um, and so, when I'm looking at travel, like I said, we're just looking at the the travel distance of the stroke, and then on the y-axis, we're looking at the max speed of the stroke. And um, we, we we pay close attention to velocity because that kind of tells us how the uh, resistive forces are working against the earth right so you're gonna you're riding your bike along you hit something in your fork moves or your shock moves and it's gonna it's gonna hit some max velocity and then based on that you know we can kinda determine hmm yeah you're you're, you're either over damped or under damped based on these velocity numbers and then these lines what these lines represent is a linear regression for um, it's basically it's a it's a best fit line for all these dots so you go and do a ride we calculate all the stuff for you if these lines line up your bike is mathematically balanced um, and we've proven this on a dyno where we said okay let's treat this you know let's just measure one sensor one uh, so the fork and the shock are basically measuring the same potentiometer it goes through and does a bunch of different um, tests and at the end those lines completely line up now you may or may not like the way the bike feels when it's mathematically balanced right so we're not telling you 
this is how you have to set your bike up. We're just telling you, hey, based on all strokes for everything you hit on this ride, high speed, low speed, all this stuff, here's how balanced your bike is. It's just a fact. And like I said, in, in our app, we have, you know, we've made a conscious effort to not tell you how to set your bike up. It, that's really up to you. What we're going to do is give you quantitative data so that when you make changes, you know what changed. You can correspond that changed, you know, in how the bike felt, right? Over time, you're going to get smart. You're going to get really smart. You're going to know exactly, wow, the bike felt like this and that corresponded to this. So therefore, my bike was packing because the data says so, right? You don't have to rely on gut feel and, you know, all that opinion. You can just look at the data and see, okay, yeah, that's, the bike felt like this and the data said it was this. So then, you know, you can kind of figure that out. Uh, the speed, so I just tap on the x-axis and I hit speed. So this is basically showing you where in the stroke the max speeds are happening. Now, if you want to look at any particular one of these, you can just kind of zoom in and it'll give you a pop-up of um, what the percentage was. So that's the percentage of the stroke where uh, where the max speed happened and what the, what the speed was. So this one was a compression for the shock or actually the rear axle. And then it happened at 44% of the travel and you know, 21 point, 2193 millimeters per second. Here's a pretty pretty fast one here, 22%, you know, 3,000 millimeters per second. So it's all right there. Um, this ends up being a little more important for the uh, shock tuning guys because they want to know where these max speeds are being achieved. Um, and I think what they're looking for is, you know, if these, if these max, if these dots are pushed way out to the right, it probably means the fork is, or shock is under damped because it's, it's resisting uh, the forces way late in the stroke and typically you want you know you want the these max speeds to happen at the closer to the you know beginning one-third to two-thirds of the stroke and then you know let the rest of it damp down to to zero velocity anyway you're probably never gonna look at this but it's there if you need it it's here um, we don't calculate best fit lines on this because it just doesn't make sense to do that now the zenith is another interesting way to look at the data. So instead of looking at the, uh, the shock or stroke length, what we're plotting here is the max position, right? So this is how deep the compression went into the travel. And so all the dots kind of move to the right. We, and so this is a good way to look at your balance in determining how much of the travel is being used, right? So if the fork is really stiff, you're going to see all those dots to the left, and that and that vertical that that slope line is going to be pretty steep. Um, and so this is, like I said, this is a good way to look at if your bike is really balanced from a dynamic sag or average position, then these should line up pretty good um, along with the travel. Now there's there's cases where, like I said, sometimes people like their, their bikes a little more raked out. So they'll set up their forks really stiff. They'll set up their shock really soft. So then you'll see all, a lot of the shock um, events are what pushed way off to the right while the fork is pushed way off to the left. So the bike won't be balanced in terms of its use of travel, but it may be pretty balanced in terms of its you know travel. So if you go back to the travel, you may see hey, it's balanced here from a speed perspective, but it not so much on the use of travel, okay? So these are really different ways to look at the data. Um, a lot of these knobs over here, so down here where it says speed, we're showing both. Um, so the, this just means that all the low, low speeds and all high speeds, if you just wanted to isolate low speed, you can come over here and set that. You can actually set that right here. If you wanted to set low speed at 900 millimeters per second, you could do that. Um, we set it to 1,000. It's just what everybody kind of thinks of is the fine line between low and high speed. So if you really wanted to fine tune your low speed balance, you can do that here. And you can see that on the compression, he's a little faster on the fork, which kind of makes sense. You, your fork is hitting the bumps first and probably absorbing some 
quite a bit of that energy before the rear shock hits it. Um, anyway, rebound, same thing. You can look at rebound here, and that'll tell you, you know, anything less than 15% is pretty gosh darn balanced. Um, you know, when you look at both, you know, if you're getting, you know, anywhere, you know, between, I don't know, less than 10% for both, then, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty balanced. Um, you will see the slope of these lines change. So if you're doing the same run over and over and over again, and you're making changes, you will see these change drastically depending on how, how much you're changing your settings. So, you know, there's a, there's, there, you know, there's kind of a process. We're not going to go into the, to, uh, the process of setting up your bike in this. We're just kind of giving you a, a deep dive in Motion IQ and kind of the capabilities here. So for balance data here, we, we kind of calculate low and high speed compression rebound balance. All that's right here based on percentage. You'll notice up here um, on the chart, on the upper left of the chart, you can see that for overall compression, um, we're at 1.3%. And um, anyway, so we, we put all these in the, in the table down here for you. On the wheel axle data, so we compare front and rear total movement. So we basically look at, you know, how much the front and rear moved on that, um, on that run. And you can see on his, 72.7 meters. I mean, it's pretty close. I mean, the front, that, mean, that just means that the total up and down travel for the fork and the shock moved at the same, which is really, really good. His max position, also pretty balanced. He's at 81%, 82% for the rear. Um, average position, pr also pretty close. You know, 21% for the front and 22% for the rear. And that's that's pretty. It's, that's a pretty aggressive setup. I've seen, I've seen forks set up as stiff as like 9% for the case of you know like a World Cup downhill racer like Greg. He's got his fork set really stiff but he's traveling at speeds that, you know, I'm not going to ever, tra ever travel at. So I'm not going to set up my dynamic sag to be at 9% of my fork, but, you know, for me personally, I'm at like 14, 15%. Um, but yeah, for this run, what you'll notice is that where you, where you want to analyze your data really matters, right? So this is a pretty short run. This was a steep downhill in the Santa Cruz Mountains with a lot of jumps and stuff. So um, you'll see that, you know, bikes were designed largely to go downhill. So if you're collecting a bunch of data and you notice that, wow, my fork is really stiff, my shock's really soft, well, it depends on where you're analyzing this data. So this is why we incorporated Strava segments so that you could uh, basically look and get a deep dive into, um, you know, specific segments, if you will. Because not all data is created equally. Um, you don't want to, you know, collect data on a dirt road and try to set your bike up based on that. It just would be dumb. But you do want to pick a, a gnarly downhill and, you know, take a few runs down that and, you know, set the bike up there. So you'll notice that the bikes look a lot more balanced when you test with them on really steep downhills with lots of rocks and lots of jumps. That's what they're designed to do. That's how they're designed to be balanced. So when you're setting up a bike, do that, okay? Don't set it up in the parking lot. Don't set it up on the road. Go out and find it. And, we, and we've made that really easy for you to isolate those segments. So that's, a lot of people don't like Strava, whatever. You know, it's a great, it's a great platform to get crowdsourced data. And it's very valuable data because it's, um, you know, you're looking at stuff that other people think is worthy of a, uh, to be measured. So go ahead and use it. It's a great, it's a great tool. Otherwise you're going to have to be doing this by hand. So you're going to rely much more heavily on that handlebar button to start and stop and, you know, point out the areas that you want to analyze your bike. Or you're going to be on a chairlift and just doing the same run over and over. And that's fine too. You can have separate recordings. But like I said, we've made it, we've made the, the tool flexible to where you could, just record all day long and then upload the tracks to Strava and then, you know, after the fact, pull down the segments you want to analyze and see, you know, see how that, how that turns out. Um, other things that we show here, uh, max compression speed. So this kind of shows you, hey, he's pretty close, 41 
millimeters a second on the fork, 42.25 on the rear. That's that's pretty balanced. 95 95th percentile. Again, pretty close. This is um, you know, I would say this is a pretty well balanced bike. Um, front uh, rebound speed. Uh, 2700. Typically, you can make the front go faster depending on the on the tune of the fork um, than the shock because you, you've got a lot more weight on the on the shock, so it's easier to get the front um, to bounce off an object and get that max rebound speed to be higher on the front. Um, and then on the 95th percentile, so this is just you know kind of a cool way to see all your balance. And I would say just this page alone took us about a year and a half to design. Um, we asked a lot of questions of the data. We scratched our heads for months, and then we kind of stumbled on doing the scatter plot, working with Greg and Jason um, after Greg got his you know new bike in 2019. And so, yeah, that's what led to this. It was a pretty great breakthrough for us. The next thing I'm going to show you is AB reports. So basically, come up to the upper left and pick. Let's just name this report. Okay, and we're, we're, we'll come over here and select some sessions. Let's just grab a few. I don't know. Yeah, let me see here. Let's try these. Done. Select values. We'll just, we'll just select them all. Okay. Make this easy. Generate report. And here's the report. So if you were diligent about, you know, keeping your segments, uh, not your segments, but all of your settings in line here, you would see what was your tire pressure, what was your high and low speed compression. You, you would see all those settings here. All your runs are lined up side by side. And down here, here's everything that we measured about that ride. And, um, you know, it makes it pretty, pretty easy to make reports. So if you're doing a lot of testing and trying a lot of different things, um, as long as you know what those recordings are, you can pick those out and create a report. In the field, it doesn't, you don't have to have internet access. It's really easy. Once you've created this report, um, it's really easy to export it. Um, so if you want to you know, toss this thing and, and move it somewhere else, you can. Uh, what else do I want to show you here? What I haven't shown in this... Um, is the ability to save this to the cloud. Um, you can come over here, use iCloud. Um, if you want to turn on or off GPS, you can do that here where it says record location. Um, what else? When you save a file, you can basically save that to the cloud. And the first time that you you know, ever use like a Google Drive, for example, you can navigate to the file that you want to save that uh, file to. And every subsequent um, recording that you save will get saved to that folder. So then it makes it really easy to, you know, record out in the field with your iPhone or your iPod Touch or whatever. And then when you get home at the end of the night, you know, if you want to use your iPad, you know, pull that open. It's got a bigger screen. You can navigate to those folder and just pull out files. So it makes it really easy to work remotely with people. Um, and that's, you know, that's all in there as well. So I would say Motion IQ is definitely a game-changing application, not just in the form factor, but in its comprehensive, uh, all the use cases that we put in here for recording, um, being intelligent about um, what you analyze, making that really, really easy. And then lastly, being able to manage the data at scale. What you'll discover when you start recording lots of data is that you know data's got gravity. You've got to keep it somewhere. So we've made that as easy as possible um, by you know leveraging these cloud platforms. You know, we thought about designing our own. We just said, you know what? You know, we're not gonna make a better file system than Google. We're just not. And all those use cases around privacy and sharing and permissions, access control, all that stuff's been done. So we're just going to leverage it and we're going to use it. And in a lot of cases, those file systems are free for the first, you know, couple of gigabytes, whatever. So, you know what? Use them. They're great. And, um, you know, it just makes it easy to share and collaborate with other people um, if you want to do that. And um, 
you know, you can just go to the, you know, let Google do their thing, let them manage the files, whether it's Box or Dropbox, whatever, you know, for you, you just want to, you just want to record, you want to have a history of what you did when. Uh, speaking of history, let's just look at one more thing before I leave uh, this recording here. Um, the session notes, you can come in here and keep track of everything on, on a recording by recording basis. So as you make changes, you can come in here and change these session notes. Okay. The next thing over here in this filter, you'll see that um, since I downloaded those, those Strava segments, there's a couple that listed here. This was a pretty short run, but I've had runs where I've, I've got like 40, 50, you know, Strava segments. And so when you pick a segment, it, it basically has some metadata about that segment. What was the grade? How much time did it take to get through there? What was the distance? You know, we get all this stuff from Strava. And so if you do get a PR, if you get a you know, PR of one, it'll show you that. If you get a KOM, you know, King of the Mountain, then that'll show that there. But um, Strava is kind of limited on what they can pull, but it's actually a pretty useful feature to be able to um, select any of these. And once you do that, everything in the app is going to get recalculated. And you'll see that the icon here changed from a filter to a Strava segment. When you come down here, you can see the segment name in the table, you know, airborne top section from stump. So pretty useful. Um, if you were to try to do this um, with the traditional system, yeah, you'd be there for a while. Um, a lot of them don't have GPS data correlated with their tracks. Some, some do, some don't. Um, either way, you're going to be writing software. So, you know, with Motion IQ, all the stuff's built in. And, um, you know, we're going to be adding a lot more features to this. This is just the start. Um, another thing you can see on this, you know, bike speed and elevation, you can see the two red lines. That's basically the segment that was mapped out. So every time you, you know, create a new segment, you're going to see that. So that's pretty much it. Um, very powerful. If you have any questions, uh, you want to learn more about, about Motion IQ, um, we have a, you know, a pretty long uh, manual that you can get online on uh, motion, you know, motioninstruments.com. Otherwise, send us an, uh, if you have any feature requests that you want, that's not, you know, things that are, would be interesting to see that are not in the app, you know, send us a, a, a note, uh, email at info at motioninstruments.com and we, you know, we'll get back to you and hopefully try to get that feature in. So hopefully you like this, uh, this recording and give me a shout. Take care.